Zenobes loved the camp in Garadef. Years from now, in the loneliness of English streets, she will miss its community, the togetherness of suffering, how, even when the police and thieves returned the women they'd kidnapped, brought them back bleeding, swollen, a rag between their thighs, the camp would heal her and revenge together. The night Zenobesh was almost taken, she found the boys and handed over her savings. Three musketeers, she said. Abbas asked why she left Eritrea, though he knew the reason. It was the same for so many. Faith. I sort of saw myself a little in their stories because I left Nigeria when I was a kid. And my father was a Muslim when he married my mother, who was a Christian, and we lived in northern Nigeria. And the north has been more or less overrun by um, the Boko Haram forces. We knew what was coming, and it had begun to affect us in very physical and personal ways, so we had to leave. Abbas had organized everything. He was a year older than Zenebesh, but streets decades smarter. He planned their escape from the camp, promising no more queues for food, no more denim jeans, tents, no more bathing in the river, no more diarrhea-ridden food. Come with me, we'll cross the desert together, us against the world. There are misconceptions about the intentions of migrants and immigrants and refugees. From this piece of work, I'd like people just to get a sense of what it is to make these journeys and what it is the young people are trying to escape or what they're trying to get. Which are the most basic things like, you know, a life. Abbas, who had found the driver with the best reputation, who gathered these provisions for the month-long crossing, rolled off another list. Rules for survival, he whispered as they boarded the truck. One, people go mad in the desert, trust no one. Two, 88 people to each jumbo truck. Three, most will sit on top of the roof. Four, if you fall asleep, you will fall. Don't sleep. Five, if you are in the middle, you will fight other passengers. Six, all drivers are vagabonds with guns. They take the women and do what they want. Seven, the best seat is on the outside by the driver's window. Eight, the journey will feel like an incredible film. But if you die, you won't come back. What surprised me was thinking that, you know, I have a decent grasp in the world as an immigrant as well. Um, I guess I assumed that I knew things and knowing, especially about that journey, and just knowing that I knew nothing at all, but just how infinitely more complex and dangerous the journey is. I, I still don't feel like I wrote it. I just edited what they told me. They call it the Blue Desert, you know, Danny said, sitting down heavily, waking Zenebesh up. Another desert, she shouted over the boat's engine. It is just as hot, nothing grows and it's endless. How long left? 62 hours, Danny replied. We've only been sailing for 10. Danny shrugged as Zenebesh turned to find the Libyan shore, now a barely visible strip in the distance. Of the 430 people crammed onto the inflatable boat, a stern-looking Senegalese man, the unofficial captain, barked at her. Look for oil. Look for the oil rig. We're not going back to Libya. Don't look back. A friend of mine once wrote that no one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. And there are lots of sharks out there, um, which we are guarded from in this country, fortunately, unfortunately, that sense of privilege sometimes swallows or numbs our potential to be neighbors to our neighbors. And I think reading the thing that I wrote can just break those walls down a little bit. <laughs>